listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I gotta tell you something, people. So Saturday night, I went to see Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets. Great show. And what's good about it was Gary Kemp, who was from Spandau Ballet, is his guitarist. And Gary was just on the show last week. So he was nice enough to comp me, and I got to meet the guys backstage. And that's the one good thing about Cooper Talk. I get to go to a lot of concerts, and I get to go, you know, for free. But years ago, I wasn't hosting Cooper Talk. I lived in Vegas for a year. And I remember seeing the show. I went... And it was a great show. It was sponsored by one of the radio stations. And it had They Might Be Giants. It had The Cramps. It had uh, Linda Perry for Four Non Blondes. It had Dada. I think it had two more acts. And then another act was on it. Was the band of my guests today. And they kicked ass. And I, I love this band. And they actually, they had one of their songs in an episode of Cold Case. Which you know, I love that show. And from Sponge, my guest is Vinny Dombrowski. How you doing, Vinny? I'm doing good, Steve. How are you today? I'm doing good. We were just talking, you know, Detroit's been uh, cloudy. Now, did you get a lot of snow this, this year? It's just a lot of cold, man. You know, it wasn't like you guys get pummeled, you know. It's like, you know, we travel out that way quite often, and we uh, managed to uh, just dodge uh, the storms in between the, the, the gigs coming out east, you know, but... You know, that's why I think we were well aware of what was going on out east. But uh, it seemed like you guys got the brunt of it. We missed a bunch of it. Yeah, it was well, we got lucky because I live right near Philadelphia, but a lot of places got their asses kicked. So, so you you, you grew up near the Detroit area. Um, when did you get into music? I, I read somewhere where I think you were a drummer. Did you start off as a drummer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was not, uh, you know, when I was uh, you know, a young kid, I was like, yeah, I wanted to play the drums. And, um, you know, we grew up inside the city of Detroit, and, and I, I think I owe a lot of the um, the environment, the, the, the clubs, and the music scene in general, uh, I owe a lot of that um, to, to the success of, uh, you know, some of the things I've done. Um, so I think certainly that that environment played a big part of me coming up and, and starting out as a drummer and just getting in there into the clubs and seeing what was going on was a huge help. Now, what were some of the bands you were watching back then? Because Detroit had a great music scene. A lot of bands came out of there. When you were younger, because I think we're the same, around the same age, and Philadelphia had a good music scene, so I would see different bands. But what were some of the bands that were, that were influencing you as you were m cultivating your musical interest? Well, I mean, two big memories certainly were like the, the Motown thing. Um, I have distinct memories of driving through the city uh, as a young kid in uh, my dad's car and the radio being on and, and in old town playing in the uh, in the car on the stereo on the radio and certainly that's uh, something that uh, you never forget about that and then and then another thing was when my my sister brought home the Bob Seger live bullet record that seemed to be something that ignited more interest in in music and it being a live record and just hearing the uh, great performance of uh, Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band and the, the sound of the audience being so enthusiastic for the great music, I think that that was kind of steering me towards um, music at a real, at a real early age. And then, of course, you know, the influence has started to blossom after that even more. So you st you started at a young age. When did you start taking the drums? I guess it was the drums at first. When did you start taking them serious? Like when you were in junior high and high school, did you have an idea that music was going to be, you know, a long time life decision for you? Yeah, I think I always took it pretty serious or, or just focused on it a lot anyway. I mean, real early on, um, you know, I enjoyed playing in a band. But I also understood that I didn't like to play cover music very much, you know. Um, we started writing songs at a real young age, like probably 12 years old. We were cranking out our own jams. Um, just, you know, certainly because, you know, listening to, being exposed to bands like Zeppelin back in the day, too, you know, I'm just like, you know, there's nobody in my neighborhood that sings like Robert Plant. But then you go, huh, now what about Iggy Pop? I think I can pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's not to diminish the uh, vocal um, abilities. I'm just going like, uh, or Steve Perry, for example. My sister, remember my sister, you know, Steve Perry, uh, the first 
Journey record, and I was just like, uh, <laughs> she's like, yeah, but he's so cute, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm going, if I'm going to party somewhere, I don't think Steve Perry is going to be, like, making us want to smoke weed and drink beer, so I'm moving on to other things, you know what I mean, like, probably, uh, you know, Iggy and Fear and The Clash and stuff like that. So you're you're getting into the music scene now. When did you form the band Loud House, and how did that band come to get together? Uh, that band was formed probably in '88 or '89. I was on the road with a group out of Milwaukee um, from there, and then I, I came back to Detroit. And the music scene in Detroit was, uh, you know, there were a lot of clubs you could go play. Uh, original music in which was really cool and uh, we started kicking around song ideas and um, and putting together this group but again the focus was writing songs getting out in the clubs and playing and fortunately again a, a ton of clubs to go out and play live original music so that was a perfect like breeding ground for that but you know that band uh, got signed to version for a hot second um, released the record and was um, dropped soon after so I mean, that, that's kind of the extent of the, uh, the group. Although, you know, it was a lot of fun. I think it was a, a fairly popular group in Detroit at the time. It just couldn't break national. Well, you, you got a record deal, which was one good thing. But now, well, now, were you still drummer for that? Were you a drummer for that band? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the band breaks up, and then that's when you form Sponge. Now, how did you end up going from drummer to vocals and... Did you want to be like Kelly Keegy from, you know, Night Ranger, drummel vocalist? I mean, how did you make the transition? Well, again, it's like wanting to continue to write. Uh, you know, I, I was part of the writing with Loud House. Um, and we thought, well, while we're looking for somebody to sing for the group, uh, let's continue to write and record. And I was like, well, I'll just sing on these tunes, you know, I'll write melodies and lyrics and songs and stuff like that and I'll keep on uh, you know uh, I'll continue to drum when I can but uh, you know singing was the uh, thing that I did on the demos and the demos were sounding pretty good so we thought it's going to be impossible to find a singer that um, we can all trust that we want to work with uh, so let's, let's find a drummer and let's just start doing gigs and that's what we did but yeah I mean I didn't want to play it Drums and sing. It, it seems kind of like too hard to front a band, you know what I mean? When you're behind a kid. Now that must be an adjustment, though, because you know I always say the the back uh, the backbone of the band is the guitarist and the bassist. To compare it to uh, the middle infield of a baseball team, the second base and shortstop. You know, without them, the field's wide open. Now you're going from being in the back of the scene to lead singer. How do you get prepared for that? Because you know people expect the lead singer to be a little you know, animator to just do something on stage. How do you get prepared to start doing that? I did it. You know, just uh, had the uh, interest to do it. Uh, uh, but I, the songs being the most important thing, so I'm just going, I'm just going to go do this shit. And, and the songs are the, the focus, really. Uh, so I just, I, I just think about whether it's Iggy Pop or Steven Tyler Those guys played drums, and uh, you know they, they got out there and they wrote songs and they sang. So you know, I mean, as far as preparation goes, I mean, I just uh, I thought I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. So let's just get out here and do it, and not even understand exactly what it was that I had to do, other than going out there and presenting the song. So now, now, how did you come up with the band name Sponge? Sponge was probably the uh, runner-up to the initial name, which I think was the Electric Cattle God. And uh, we were going to do a show uh, in a club in Detroit, and the owner of the club wanted to know what band name to put up on the marquee. And we were like, well, it's Electric Cattle God. And he said, I don't have enough letters for that. So <laughs> we were just like, well, put Sponge up there. And uh, he put Sponge up there, and that's kind of how we made the choice. Now you guys start playing gigs. Do you get hot in the Detroit area? Do you find that following that that you're uh, 
that Loud House had, or did you have to start from the beginning, or how did you guys start breaking into the Detroit scene? Uh, we weren't that interested in playing in Detroit at first. We did a lot of gigs out of town, you know, probably and initially playing the Avalon in Chicago a ton of times, just jumping on anything we could do outside of town, and then uh, eventually coming back around to Detroit to do a ton of shows in Detroit. Now, when did the record companies start getting interest in you guys? Uh, probably halfway through the recording process uh, of the first record, because we pretty much had the first record in the bag before the record, any record company got interested in the group. So we were out doing gigs and writing songs and I guess doing everything a, a band should be doing and, uh, and recording on our own dime. So, you know, it was just like what we did and uh, we started to get some interest, you know. Now, once you get interest, how did they end up getting you with the deal? Because you said you you're, have been recording, you've been doing all the, the work and on your own dime, of course, you want to find someone to finance it. When did, uh, how did that happen? How did the record company find you? There were some, some of the, um, the, the infrastructure, so to speak, between like, uh, we were uh, involved with a production company with Loud House that we, we cut ties with. And um, there was a, um, some man a manager, um, some lawyer connections that we had that um, we followed back around with and presented these songs, you know, these recordings to, and there was some interest uh, from some labels regarding the songs. And, you know, they, and then they were just like, well, we want to see the band, you know what I mean? So that was, uh, you know, I think, the way a classic sense of how, you know, a lot of groups got signed. Uh, you know, a label wants to come out and see a band, you know, they want to see what you're doing. So um, that was probably how that happened, as far as I can recollect. So you get the deal, and now... They have to pick a single. What was the first single picked off the album? And did you guys have input in that, or was it the record company that chose what you were going to have? Uh, that, that was a collective decision. I thought it was a good one. Uh, it was a track called Nina Menasha. I think we led the, um, the release of the record. With, yeah, it was led by Nina Menasha. the first thing. We made a video for that. And then um, eventually brought us to Cloud, I think was the second single off of Riding Pinata, and then uh, Molly being the third single from that record. I think we even went to a fourth single, maybe it was Rain in My House from the first record, um, and did a video for that as well. What was your take on the video process? Because back then, videos were big. I mean, you know, there was it was a time when videos made a difference, and, you know, they were bigger budgeted. Were, were you excited to do the videos? Did you think that it could propel you? Because MTV back then actually had videos playing? Yeah, I mean, it was between the way folks learned about music, obviously didn't have YouTube back then. Um, so folks learned about new music, uh, either from the new radio format that, that had uh, exploded, which was uh, the alternative rock format. And up until, I think it was probably 19... 90, I don't think there was any such thing as an alternative rock format. There was a rock format where they were playing the usual Zeppelin, ACDC stuff. Um, but then there were a lot of new bands like uh, James Addiction and Red Hot Chili Peppers and these bands were not bands that, you, you know, you would play on the radio along with uh, ACDC and there's you know, I love ACDC, but it was just like two different animals. So between MTV and the alternative rock format, people started to learn about a lot of new bands and Sponge being one of those bands. And of course, you know, making videos, I just go, it's part of the course. Do I like to take pictures and make videos? No, nah, I like to be in the studio recording songs. Um, but uh, of course, you needed to do that type of thing. And yes, and MTV was a big proponent of playing videos and part of the whole process of getting people to uh, hear new bands. Now, you you have everything going on. You got the, uh, the videos going, the album's doing well. When do you start feeling that you guys are, you know, making a splash? Because there are so many bands out, you know, and that's the one thing. But, you know, you guys did well because, I mean, the album went gold. But how, when did you feel like you were doing a splash, you were making a splash? Was there a certain point where you said, you know what, this 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 you know, this album is going somewhere? 
Well, it seemed to be a long, long haul for the record to break. Um, I think Detroit was one of the last markets to actually add uh, Plowed as a single, which is kind of ironic. And, you know, Loudhouse never had any love for radio in Detroit. Um, but when we started to see the radio stations add Plowed in Detroit, like I'm talking K Rock added Plowed, I believe, out in LA before we were getting any love in the Detroit market. Uh, we had we did have some friends at radio that would play the songs, but not like official ads at the time. I know Cleveland was playing it before Detroit added it. So um, when we started seeing Detroit get on board with what we were doing, um, I think that at that point we thought, well, we finally have broken on through and we've done something. Now, when did uh when what was the first time you heard one of your songs on the radio? Good God, I don't remember. Really? No, <laughs> I, mean, I I can't recall that like the, the moment, you know, like I go, Oh, well, there it is, you know, now now um, you know, we're here, we're there. It may have been in LA, but I can't I can't like recall. Um yeah, I really can't recall. So your 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 album's getting big and now are you, what kind of gigs are you doing? And then do you start getting to open for new act, bigger acts? Well, I mean, it's funny. Just having a, a record deal, you would think that uh, you have all kinds of opportunities to go out and, and play gigs and you know, start working with other bands and touring. But that was kind of a slow go as well. Um, you know, we were out uh, after the release of the record still doing nightclubs. And doing a lot of shows as a headliner in nightclubs, which I didn't mind that at all because you could look at um, uh, BDS, which is, uh, you know, where you're getting spins at radio at the time uh, per week, you know, who's banging the song a lot. And uh, we could roll in with that kind of info and know what kind of business we were going to do at the clubs at the time, you know. So uh, being a headliner in, in clubs didn't bother me at all. As a matter of fact, we would take other bands on tour with us at the time. And like, uh, you know, Everclear uh, started touring with us uh, after they had gotten signed. You know, it's kind of like a baby band coming out. And, uh, you know, we would take Ned's Atomic Dust band or Letters to Cleo. Um, and we'd put together, you know, small packages and, and, and head out into the clubs. So, now, did you open for Kiss? Did we open for Kiss? Yes, we we did a show in Detroit. It was supposed to be like a farewell tour, and Allison James was on the gig. And we were coming back uh, for a couple of days off. We were on the road, but we had a couple of days that uh, we were coming back to Detroit to hang out. And um, uh, Scott Whelan was uh, going back in the rehab because Stone Temple Pilots was supposed to play that show and since we were rolling back into town Scott was um, going back into rehab our manager Susan Silver asked us if we wanted to play that show um, she managed Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and, and uh, she also managed Sponge and we were like we had two choices we were, we were going to go do some UK dates with Alanis Morissette because she was a brand new artist at the time or we were going to go play with our pals, uh, House and Chains, and uh, open for Kiss. So we're like, uh, that's a no-brainer. I guess we're going to play with Kiss and House and Chains. So. so now, the whole time you're on the road and when the album is out, when Rotting Pinata is out, are you starting, you as a writer and a performer, because you said you enjoy writing, are you starting to think of the follow-up and what songs you're going to do, or are you too busy consumed by being on the road and promoting and going out to different radio stations? Well, we, we always continue to exchange ideas on the road. You know, you got a cassette player, um, and somebody's got a riff, and we were accumulating different riffs and, and ideas and stuff like that. But we just continue to write. Um, that always seemed to be a focus thing. So as soon as we wrapped up touring the, the Roddy Pinata record at the end of 95, I think it was, we went right in to start demoing the um, the Wax Static record at the, right at the beginning of um, 96 uh, over the holidays and then got that record recorded and that, that record was it was a real quick turnaround we released that record 
I think in July of 96. So, I mean, I think because of the fact that we just like to write so much, there was no big stretch for us to go in and crank out like 20 demos or 25 demos and then go, okay, what are we going to do for the record? Well, now, early in your career, though, you started getting uh, TV and movie shows interested in playing uh, your songs. How did, did they go through you once again, or did they go through the record company? You mean like uh, licensing a sponge song from a movie? Yeah, for like Empire Records and Mall Rats and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, quite frankly, I think it has to do a lot uh, uh, still to this day with some kind of visibility with bands. I know that um, you're out there and you got some songs that resonate with people and most of them that'd be cool you know in some movies so Kevin Smith he was interested in, in, in some of our songs and, and um, Empire Records yeah they, they did uh, they licensed Plows for that movie so yeah I mean that kind of thing it seemed to be like um, a thing that bands uh, did do back then I think bands do it even more today now, you also appeared on Letterman. What was that like? Because, you know, Letterman, I, I'm a big Letterman fan. And what was your experience on the Letterman show? Uh, they always treated us great. I mean, people talk about the studio being very, very cold, and it certainly was. But it could be on that show where the young person I would watch Letterman, and I think David Letterman is just a, you know, a great American. You know, I think he's a great guy. And uh, to be honest, so yeah, it freaked me out a little bit just because I'm going... I used to watch other people on the show, and now we're in the studio, so it was a real big deal. But uh, it was a lot of fun. They treated us great, and they had great production, so we felt pretty comfortable after we got in there. Now, after you do a show like that, do you notice a spike in records, or is that just something that you can't tell? I think it was more of a... Uh, you could tell, like, there was really some kind of buzz going on in the clubs. You know, like, we were... Like, I couldn't tell what was going on as far as record sales, but as far as, like show attendance for us, club attendance and selling tickets at shows, it really put us, it, it spiked that a lot. Now, as you're going through the years, there's been lineup changes. How does that happen? I mean, you've been you've been there since the get-go. And I just say, it, it's the 25th anniversary of uh, Rotting Pinata is coming up. It is now. What is it like for you to know you're the, you're the, the guy who's been there the whole time? I mean, you know, technically, if people are fans, they think of you, they think of the band. How does how do you acclimate through the different changes you've had, and were any of them something that you were upset when someone left? Well, I think that um, for me, I mean, I I don't I don't like lineup changes. You know, I don't have to I don't like to have to deal with that that kind of thing. And I think what happens is I, I know what I want to do. I want to write songs and record and be in a band tour do that whole thing it's, I mean it's all I've ever really understood or known I, I yeah or I wish I could have uh, been in the mindset of maybe you know going to college or pursuing some degree after high school but this is all I've ever done even prior to getting out of high school so uh, what happens is I think when you're around other folks that um, decide that they, they want to take another direction in life uh, more power to them. I mean, it's a crazy thing to be in a band. People look at it and they go, oh man, you guys must, uh, you know, just love life and uh, everything that you guys do is just a, 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 it's a beautiful day, you know? And I think, you know, um, people really don't see what's going on behind the scenes of all of that. So it can be a, a, a real, it can, for lack of better words, a motherfucker, you know what I mean? It can be a real bitch as far as what the business is and the lifestyle and all these things. So um, that's why guys start bowing out. They decide they want something else to do with their life. And um, I, I certainly am not going to stop. Again, I know what I wanted to do with my life. But um, just being um, aware of how tough it is, I can respect when somebody wants to bow out. So getting back to like some of these guys bowing out, some of these fellows bowed out, but we've had a really pretty steady lineup since about 2003. Uh, Andy Padlin on guitar and Kyle Neely. So we've been going on now here, let's see, 16 years with the guitar players. Billy, our drummer, I think he's going on 18 or 19 years, and Tim Padlin's been in the mix from some street. Tim Padlin's been involved in the group um, making records with us, and he plays bass. So it's been a pretty, pretty steady lineup uh, uh, 
uh, since about 2003. Now, do you feel more pressure than the other guys in a band because you are the lead singer, you are the face of the band? Do you feel sometimes that you have an extra pressure to keep the band together? Because if you leave, you know, Sponge probably won't be Sponge anymore because you're the lead singer Sponge, and to replace you would be hard, and that goes a lot of the whole backbone and sound of it. Well, if I feel any pressure, it's just um, the pressure trying to represent the music uh, when we get up there and do a show. You know, I don't want to phone it in ever. You know, it's got to be real, and it's got to be presented right. And that that's the pressure to me. If there's any pressure, um, is to do it right. We're just not going up there and cashing a check or doing some crap like that. We want to get up there and do it for the right reason. So that that's the big thing, is to, is to, is to do it well. Now, as you're... The band is keep playing, you know, and you're coming out with new albums, and, you know, the music scene changes. Did you see any reflection in your writing when the music scene does change here or there, or did you always just stick to your guns and write what you wanted to? Well, you know, we've always tried to write what we want to write. I think a lot of it has to do with production, you know, like what, what, uh, how things are wrapped, how a song is wrapped, and what kind of production. And I think people can be critical of how it is that the, a song is recorded. You know, writing is a guitar and vocal to me. You know, that's, I now write a song or somebody hands me a guitar part and I'll write something to it. That, to me, that's writing. But production is a different thing. And, uh, you know, me and myself, I've given bands all the, you know, the leeway they want over the years to uh, write and produce songs how they want to. Whether it's like something like Blondie or the Rolling Stones or Zeppelin, you know, um, I give them all kinds of way to do what they want to do. So I just write what I want to write. But uh, when it comes to how a record is produced, that's a different story altogether. So I just try to write what I like to write. Now, what is your share of the writing? Are you the sole writer or do you share the writing? Or is it an open form? How does that work? Well, I mean, I, 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 I got to tell you, I, I can't recall changing uh, very much about how it is that I write. I've gone into situations with the old band where um, I pretty much wrote with uh, Joe Mazzola and Mike Cross, the original guitar players in the early band days. Although we did what a lot of bands do, from what I understand, like band like R.E.M. and U2, they split all the publishing and writing up equally. And that's what we were doing in the early band. Um, certainly, I guess I would be the um, you know, the, the main writer today, but uh, I don't mind sharing publishing and writing with folks that write with me, that actively write with me. You know, I try not to give something away these days um, if, if somebody wasn't uh, actively writing with me. Now, through your the career, Sponge's career, you've been on different labels. How does that how does that happen? How do you get dropped from a label and then get picked up on another one? And there's has there been any instance where it was longer than you thought that you guys would get picked up, or were you surprised that they dropped you? Uh, surprised that we were dropped. You know, I I think that yeah, that we made a move from. Chaos, which was a part of the, like the Sony umbrella, Columbia, or no, I'm sorry, the Sony umbrella, and we moved from there on the first record to Columbia proper on the second record. Moving on to the third record, they wanted us to start doing some stuff that we weren't necessarily willing to or accustomed to, which was using like their A and R people, and they wanted to use outside writers. So when they had a bleak in Columbia and going to Beyond Records, which that was Alan Kovacs label, and he had like Blondie and uh, Motley Crue, so I thought that was a pretty um, reasonable choice. And that label ended up going belly up. So that left us without a label for a minute, for a couple of years, and then we signed a deal with an independent label out of Dallas, Texas, and um, we did um, two records on that label, which took us up to about 2005. And 2008, there was another label, I think called Bellum or something like that, and um, it was just disastrous results with that. Um, and I think that label ended up going bankrupt. 
<laughs> and then uh, uh, we did something with uh, uh, man, what's the label out of Brooklyn. I got to think of the name of that label. I'll think of it in a minute. We put a record out with them in 2013. So three one three. Been, uh, what's that? Is was it three one three? Three one three is like our you know the band label. So we've done some stuff under three one three. And, um, you know, it, it seems like we do that in between labels. Uh, and so, like, there was a record that came out here recently, which is something we released called Demoed in Detroit. And that came out on Cleopatra Records. And, uh, like, the beer sessions we put out on the band label. And, of course, we distribute that through something as simple as CD Baby. And they seem to be very effective about how they do stuff. So I was like, well, we can release this on CD Baby. So, I mean, we've done things many different ways over the years, but it seems like we've always acted as independently as we possibly could, even when we had a label. We seem to do a lot of stuff on our own. Now, you started your own label. What is the process of starting your own label? And do you make more money when you start your own label and start your record start selling? Well, I mean, all of the... I like the idea of owning the masters, you know. When you release a record on your own, you're not splitting up any money with any label. The other issue, though, is promotion. How do you effectively promote the release of a record? So, you know, we'll get out there and we'll play gigs and we'll do as much press as we can let folks know that a record's out there. But, you know, the idea of spending money at radio to do independent radio promotion and or video promotion, that's a whole different story. So, you know, I've, I've attempted to find labels to spend money and uh, release a record and do independent radio promotion uh, for some of our records, like uh, the um, Stop the Bleeding record that we released in 2013. Um, uh, there was money spent on that record uh, at radio, but it wasn't it wasn't my money, you know. Somebody basically buys the rights to the album and then they spend money to um, release that record and promote it. Now, you, you've had a bunch of albums. How, how do you decide when they're going to... I mean, you look at your... Your, your order, you know, 2000, at later, you know, 2003, 2005, 2007, 2013, 2016. When do you decide that it's time for a new album? Is it something that it's a, it's a group decision or it's just something you're writing and you go, damn it, man, I got a lot of, a lot of songs here. We got to do something with it. Uh, you know, we really didn't even think about releasing a beer sessions record. You know what I mean? We were thinking about releasing singles. And uh, that just morphed into an entire record. And we had an EP put together uh, before the Stop the Bleeding record 2013 was released. And um, and then decided, well, this label's interested. We'll give them a whole record. So it's weird in this climate where everybody just listens to a song or buys a song. Uh, to go out and make an entire record, I just go, eh. I don't know if it's very prudent, but we do it anyway, you know. Now, people just start buying records. You know, and that's so irritating. You know, I talk about my, this to my guests a lot that, you know, it used to be a big thing when you got a, when you got a record. You know, you, you, you listen to it, you, you turn it, you looked at it, you read the liner notes, you, you liked, you noticed the songs and the order and you noticed how much time it was because back then records were like, you know, 35, 40 minutes. Now they're longer. But do you miss that as someone who, you know, takes pride in his work and likes to put out a whole album out? As a musician, do you miss that now people have such a short attention span that they only buy one single and they don't get a chance to really experience an album? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really feel what you're saying. I think we're so far beyond people, like, experiencing a right, like sitting long enough to experience a record, you know. I don't see people putting their headphones on and kicking their feet up and putting the smartphone down and going, ah, I don't listen to Dark Side of the Moon, you know what I mean? Like we did when we were kids, you just sit there and you listen to a record because that's what you did. But these days, I just don't see it. And I think we're so far removed from even like giving people that experience, unless it's in a live venue, you know, we've done that thing that a lot of bands do, which is play 
a record from front to back the way we recorded it, and that's you're forced to sit there and listen to it. Um, but um, yeah, we're too far removed anymore, so I can't get my brain wrapped around offering something to somebody like here's a whole record. And so I almost feel like releasing singles. You know, I would rather release a single a month all year. You know. Now, does that affect your writing process? Because you know that, you know, and I'm sure your earlier albums, you know, you wrote your songs and you figure people are going to listen to the whole thing. As a songwriter who's been in the business, I mean, you know, your 25-year anniversary of uh, Robbing Pinatas, the record company, the record industry has changed. As a writer, do you change and sit there? I mean, you said you'd love to rec- release 12, you know, one single every month. Do you, when you're writing, do you think I got to make this sound like a single so people will listen to it, or do you sit there and go, I just got to write this and hope they listen to it? I mean, I just I've done what I've done for since we started as a band. You know, like you're in a room with a bunch of guys and you got a song idea, and it's like a shootout for the best ideas. You know what I mean? So it's like I still use. Um, you know, I got. We, uh, we'll take songs and record it, demo a song, I'll give it to Andy, the guitar player, you know, and, and bounce it off of him and see what, if he can do anything to, to add to the tune or give me some guidance as to what's good or what's not good, you know. It's the, the process certainly hasn't changed, and, and, I, and I'm still aware of that process, but, you know, as far as me going, well, that's a single. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you that Plod would be a single and survive at radio for 25 years, you know, I... I, I had no idea, even when we got done recording, I thought it was a cool tune, but it didn't sound like, you know, um, Highway to Hell. It didn't sound like Stairway to Heaven, you know what I mean? So I just go, uh, who's to say that's going to be a hit? Now, through your career, because you've had a long career, is there anyone you got to share the stage with or you got to meet that just blew blew you away? You're like, holy shit, this is such and such. Um, yeah, I mean, like sharing the stage with the Cramps and, and at the new NLV was really cool. Lux and Carrier, that was just fantastic. Um, you know, meeting David Bali and uh, touring with Iggy, that was a that was a big deal. Now, how is your how is the touring? I mean, have you traveled to Europe? Have you traveled? I mean, I've been all over the states. How is your touring, and how often did you do it in your beginning, and how often are you doing it now? Well, it's been a number of years since we toured Europe. I think the last time we were there was probably about 1990, 1996. I, yeah, probably in 96. Now, how often do you guys tour? I know you have a tour coming up to support the 25-year 25, 25 anniversary, but how often do you try to keep it on the road? We have a, a lot of dates uh, throughout the year now. You know, we're... we're getting booked up pretty solid, which I like. I think we're doing what a lot of bands do to be smart. You know, we're doing Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, things like that coming home. Um, 2016, we were out there on the road with the, the Summerland Tour. 2013, we did Summerland as well. So those tours were, uh, you know, extended um, groups of dates, which is cool. But, you know, we're out there still very active, and we got a ton of dates on both coasts, uh, throughout the year so the schedule's looking good you know the, the pulse is feeling good on the, the, uh, the sponge now do you do you miss the room when you're not out there or is it something that you've done it for so long that you sort of were like um, it's sort of a grind now I mean as we get older our bodies change our, you know, we can't be like we were 20 years ago for you what is the tour like now is it does it get on you because you're on your voice how do you take care of your voice well I mean you know just can't be out there whooping it up every night is, is the big thing. You know, years ago, certainly uh, we could do that, but these days, man, I got to be more conscious of that. I just can't be out there hanging out till like five or six in the morning and get two hours of sleep and get up and do it all over again. You know, it just it's not proactive, man. It just does not work. So I just got to be careful about you know being out there doing extracurricular things I shouldn't be doing. Right. So it is a the, it is a 25th anniversary. Are you going to play the whole album in, in in its entirety, or how are you going to formulate your sets for the upcoming tour? Well, we, we what we do, we feature the record. We feature Rodney Pinata. What happens is, what we notice, Steve, is like the, 
Like if we play the song, the record in its entirety, the record is not laid out in a way that makes a great set. So we end up you know, taking requests. We'll certainly play anything on the record for the most part, with the exception of candy corn, perhaps. That's weird. Um, but uh, we just break it up and we play some newer things, just stuff to make it good for the crowd. Because it's really a tough listen at, at times, you know. So, um, playing slower tempo tunes like Drown and Next to Miles or something like that, whatever it is, you know. We're just going to be conscious of the pacing of the set, that's all. Now, do you love the fact that there, you'll have people coming out who listen to that album 25 years ago that have been with you since the beginning? I mean, as an artist, how does that make you feel? Is there any plans to record a new album at this time, or are you just sitting there concentrating on the tour? No, we've been in and out of uh, the studio. Uh, we may release a single or two here yet uh, in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. Now, how is it for you guys as a band, because that crowdsourcing is so big, and people want to get involved, and people want to do that. Do you crowdsource at all, or is that something that you would want to do? Because people will, if people want to hear music, they will help, you can get your record done for free. Well, yes, we've, we've used uh, Pledge Music uh, over the years, uh, probably 2014, I think it was, we started, but uh, um, what's happened it's turned into a co-op mess. What's going on is Pledge Music stopped paying the bands. So, I mean, understand this. You're somebody that wants to pre-order a band's record or, you know, get a T-shirt and a poster that's signed and maybe a CD. And what you've done is you've taken their money, but you haven't given the money to the bands. So Pledge Music is essentially shut down. Right now, there's a big article on Billboard, and people would always look at the labels and go, well, evil record labels and all this kind of crap. And what you would think would be the most reliable thing, where bands are getting money from fans for pre-orders, and that money would go to the bands. Now the bands have been just kind of screwed, and uh, Pledge Music is shut down. So as far as, uh, I have another band called The Orbitsons, kind of like a uh, outlaw country group and uh, we attempted to crowdsource a record in the last few months and, and to release it and uh, Pledge just kind of put us on the thin end of the stick and snapped it, snapped it off, you know what I mean so to speak, so uh, we ended up uh, fulfilling all the pledges anyway and got everybody the records but Pledge owes us the money and uh, I'm talking you know, you can look up PledgeMusic.com and you can see some of the bands that have done campaigns. It's just huge bands. That one, you too. Everybody's crowdsourced these days. But the site is essentially shut down because you can no longer pledge. And the, the, they've gone quiet. They uh, have not paid anybody as far as I know any money. Well, you just mentioned another band. How did you start that other band? Pardon me? No, you mentioned another band you started. What made you decide to start another band? Just because it's a different type of music you wanted to play? Oh, man. You know, just songwriting. That, that's what always interested me. You know, I think starting with the Black Ecstatic record back in the day and, and doing some country esque things and that. I've always been interested in country, old school country songs and things like that. So over 20 years ago, um, I put a band together um, to go out and play gigs with that group doing that kind of music. So it's always just been a labor of love and a, a lot of fun, you know. So you have you have a bunch of East Coast dates first, then you play you have you're you're in Michigan and you and then you go to California and then you're playing at the whiskey. 
What is it like you for you guys when you go to California and play a venue like the Whiskey? Because it's such a legendary place. You know, I lived in L. I just moved back two years ago. I lived in L.A. for 18 years. And it's just, it's a different scene out there. than the, I think people actually appreciate the music more back east in the Midwest because, I don't know, L.A.'s, it's superficial. But what is it like for you guys when you get to sit there and play at a bar, a place like the Whiskey? Are you excited about that? Or is it to you, it's just another gig? Well... I just I, I like the they have a historical marker on the building now, which I, I think is just dynamite. I'm glad the building is still there. Um, I get a real kick out of walking into that place and thinking about you know Morrison or Van Halen or you know, any of these great groups that have come through there to play. And you know we heard the Kiss went through there not too long ago to actually do a set, and I'm, I'm always know that that's just really cool. The fact is, they treat us really well there. They they have us back every year, and uh, because of the we have so much reverence for the room, and they treat us so good, we just uh, we can't help but go back. We just uh, love to go back there and play. We hang out there uh, prior to the gig or next door at the Irish Bar, and, and and we have a great time. We have friends down. It, it feels like a, you know, like a old home week, you know. Now, who creates your set list when you're playing, and do you vary from it when you're, like, on this tour? Are you going to vary from the set list, or do you sit there and have it all written out, here's what you're going to do, here's your encore? No, there's no set list. It's a thing. We just, we just go out there, you know, we just start to set out with Wax Ecstatic, but then you know, whether we're doing Molly or Roddy Pinata or Glue or whatever it is next, it just kind of goes from there. And we, we do like to uh, get the, the audience input. Now, how long will your sets be on this tour? And are, are the, does the does the bar or club supply the opener, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, the clubs definitely uh, bring in the support acts, and our set typically, you know, somewhere at least seventy-five minutes, between seventy-five and ninety. Well, that's cool. So the tour's coming up. You're only, you only you need to get into Philly. I mean, Quaker Quaker Town. You're playing there. That's not too far. It's about sixty miles from Philly. But you got to play in Philly because we have a great music scene here. I think the last time we got to Philly was, man, was it uh, Summerland? 2016, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, but we love coming to that. Now, is there a chance of you being on another Summerland tour, or does that is that stopped going, or what is that? Well, we're, we're nearly into May right now, and I think Art was going to put something like, to get, uh, like that together, and Art's never very... He's the guy that started it and uh, you know, puts all the groups together. Is um, I, I don't know if he's going to do it this year. I mean, if we were involved in something like that, we would have known probably in early March what was going on, but we haven't heard anything about it. So. Okay, well, I want to thank you for coming on. And uh, the tour is starting. Are you excited about the tour? Oh, man, we're pumped up. Always pumped up to go out and play. The, the tunes and represent it good and see old friends and, and, and have a great time. So, yeah, we're always excited to go out there and do it. Well, when you look back at that album, well, I mean, what goes through your mind that it's been for 25 years, it's been lasting, people still want to hear it. I mean, does that is that are you more proud of the, the songwriting or the performance or what makes you the most, you know, proud about Rotting Pinata? I, I just look at the songwriting. That's it. You know, I go, wow, song. Who would have thought? Exactly. So anyway, I want to thank you, Vinny. Uh, people, go to Sponge's website. It's spongetheband.com. They have a Facebook page. Probably your Facebook page, I'm guessing, is just they can look up Sponge. Yeah. Well, Facebook is Sponge Rocks. So it's facebook.com forward slash Sponge Rocks. Or like you said, spongetheband.com. So people, go check them out. Go to one of the shows, they, they're, and they're filling in more shows. They have some in April. They're starting, uh, you're going to be going out uh, this Thursday. They'll be in New Jersey, but up North Jersey. They got Delaware. They got Harrisburg. They got a lot of gray areas. So go out and see them. Go to the website. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 700 episodes there. Email me, cooper, at coopertalk.net. I'll definitely get back to you. And follow me on Twitter, at coopertalk. So remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water. Eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.